Thanks, David. That's fantastic. Um, no time for questions on that, but the whole session is going to be there, so you'll have an opportunity to question David and the others on, on some of those points that he raised. Now, given David's uh, insistence that life stories are important, before I introduce Dave Westcott up to talk about Crown of Thorns starfish management and control, I have to say that um, there is a group of, again, very clever uh, marine ecologists who study crown of thorns for quite a long time. And they came together in a meeting and um, put their very clever and very competent views on the table. But we were thinking at the time, could we actually do this pest management, integrated pest management? And uh, the only person I knew who had actually been terribly successful with that in an ecological environment rather than an agricultural environment was Dave Westcott and his team, Cameron and, and some others. So I rang up Dave and I said, how would you like to come in and do Crown of Thorns? And he said, bugger off you stupid woman. And I said, that's not very nice. And invited him again a couple of weeks or so later and said, how about you come in and talk Crown of Thorns, integrate pest management around Crown of Thorns starfish. Finally, with you know, and half Nelson the whole order, we dragged him into the room. And to our great delight, it has been a pretty successful agenda to bring somebody who had, did, had done compelling work in around feral pigs, around uh, flying foxes, but probably more importantly around myconia and invasive weed pests in rainforest. And whilst a whole lot of the marine ecologists screamed and threw themselves on the floor, what does somebody who scrounges around in rainforest know about the marine environment? It's the systems and the thinking that was important. So I invite Dave Westcott to the table, or to the, to the podium, but I will say somebody completely out of the box, looking very differently at an inherent issue and coming up with a very different way of doing business. So again, this is outside the box thinking. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Sheridan. I'm blushing. Um, so, what I'm going to do is uh, first off correct Sheridan's story. I did not use such polite language. <laughs> and it took her quite a while, and it's true, it was a half Nelson. Um, so, what I'm essentially going to do in this talk is give you an overview of what we are doing in the COTS um, program within NEST. In, there'll be two sessions after this, this um, talk in this room where a whole lot of researchers will be talking about the work that we're doing. I want to give you a history of where we got to the design that underpins the selection of um, projects in NEST and the ideas that were driving that. So I think if I hit that button... How do I do this? Ah, oh, there it is. All right. So I, do, I want to start out by saying that this wasn't just sort of Cameron and I sitting around and, and by ourselves um, hatching ideas. We spent a lot of time talking with a whole range of people. And so in particular, Sheridan um, Morris drove this idea of using what we'll call an integrated pest management approach. We sat down and refined these ideas with people from a whole range of different institu research institutions from the Bumpa and critically from the uh, um, control operators, uh, the Association of Marine Park Tourism Operators, who really gave us a lot of time, laughed very hard at a lot of our ideas um, and, and really improved all of the things that we were doing. So if we step back and think, look at the history of outbreaks on the GBR, what we know is we've had four major outbreaks since about the 1960s, and this is the rough time frame of those outbreaks, remembering that we don't quite know when they start, and they tend to go on for quite a long time. Um, but at least in each of these outbreaks, there has been a response. People have gone out and tried to manage COTS, and this has generally been led from the very beginning, being led by tourism operators. But in the second and third outbreaks, um, we saw there was a governmental response as well. And an advisory, advisory committees were established to review the evidence to make recommendations about how we move forward. And 
the, if you go back and you read those documents and the publications of the period, what you see is that there was a, a real sort of feeling of dismay. Uh, they looked at the available evidence and they looked at the available technologies for controlling COTS and basically said, it's not possible, we can't do it. And so what we have to do is really focus on control at individual tourism sites and we need to think hard about how to prevent the next COTS outbreak. And so both in terms of the management objectives and in terms of research, the focus was on preventing outbreaks rather than actually managing existing outbreaks. Um, and that continued all the way through until the present outbreak. And, but something changed in, with the present outbreak and there were two advances which I think gave us the opportunity to think very differently about how we approach COTS outbreaks. The first was that rather than tourism operators doing their control essentially independently, we saw a coordinated approach led by Gabrumpo, by the Association for Marine Park Tourism Operators and by RRRC. A single vessel going out and working in addition to the tourism operators themselves, doing it in a, a, you know, according to a plan, collecting data, etc. That's actually a really big step forward. The second thing was the work that came out of Melbourne Pratchett's group at JCU where we got a new way of, of culling cots, the single injection method, and that fundamentally changed the economics of what we were doing. Now, we came onto the scene um, after, really, in just, just to get Sheridan off our backs, we came onto the scene in 2014-2015-ish, and coming from outside the marine sphere, that my personal impression was talking with all of the different players in the field, was, it was really confusing. It was, we were clearly in a transition period. Management objectives were still focused on preventing next outbreaks, it seemed, but management action on water was about controlling what was happening in this current outbreak. So objectives and ways of achieving those objectives seemed a bit unclear. Um, but on a research side, it was even worse because People, researchers were still focused on preventing outbreaks, but because there are a lot of good minds operating, there are a lot of good ideas out there, and it was really hard to line up what, so what was the key research, what was going on. There were too many unknowns, too many hypotheticals, lots of different voices. What we really needed was a framework, or what I needed was a framework in which to organise our idea, my ideas and how I thought we were going to approach this problem. I had to recognise, though, at the start, we had a really strong imperative for action. You know, the, the reef is valuable. We, we care about it, so we need to get out there. We had a good control program and good institutional structures to support a control program. We didn't have as much information as we wanted, but we could paint a pretty good ecological and um, operational picture of the problem. And there was a whole lot of really good minds out there doing really good work, so we could take advantage of that. So the, the first thing is that if we want to have a coordinated approach, then management and control and, so the policy level and control and the research all need to be on the same page. We need to have a coherent sort of strategy for all of those different areas and those strategies, that's, it needs to be a unified strategy. So one of the first things that we set out to do was actually to develop a management and research strategy, not separate strategies, but a single strategy. Um, we also made the decision that the opportunity was to focus on the existing outbreak. Other groups were working on, work, uh, working on water quality, so we would focus on an existing outbreak, and that means that we had to focus on, initially in the first place at any rate, on existing methods for controlling COTS. Now, we made the assumption that, that, that these methods were effective, and the evidence to support that was that after 50 years of experience, tourism operators were still investing in local, air, you know, on, on site um, COTS control. But that's also a research question, it's something that I'll present on later on this morning. And our major task was to say, how can we scale that kind of operation up to make it uh, effect, get, to give us meaningful outcomes at much, much larger spatial scales? We also needed to recognise that this was going to be a learning process, 
that we wouldn't get it right all the time and every time and first off, and that we had to be able to adapt our framework to make sure that um, we could learn and improve. So the way to do that was essentially to adopt an integrated pest management style approach, and fundamental underpinning of that is that we have to have base everything we do around a model of the, how the ecological system is operating. And then secondarily on top of that, we need to have a model of how the operations or the control operations um, will work. And we need to look at how those two systems interact. But the most important part is making sure that the ecological underpinnings are correct. And the reason for that is that while we might be focused on manual and control at the moment, our hope is that we will get new control technologies coming onto the scene. So the, the technologies and the operations might change, but it's pretty clear that that fundamental ecological system is going to stay relatively constant. All right. Um, so having said that we need to focus on the ecology first and foremost, I'm going to talk about the management first and foremost. And, uh, we have to recognise that managers, there's only a few things that managers actually do. So when they're out on the water, they're out there affecting control in some way, reducing the numbers of cots. Um, so we need to think about how they do that. Um, and the other, one other thing that they can do is figure out where they have problems and where they should be implementing control. And, they, and you do that through surveillance. And so we need to know how to do surveillance and we need to be at, know how to do that at a variety of different scales. And then it, perhaps the most important thing is that we actually make decisions about what we're going to do and when. And so we need a whole range of tools to support um, managers in making those decisions, to organise information, uh, to do analyses that provide them with guidance. It doesn't replace their decision, um, their input to the decision making. It simply gives them the support that they need to have some confidence in making those decisions. So those were the areas we were going to focus in, but critically decision making requires that you have objectives. And objectives really are guiding pretty much everything that we do. And again, having just said that, even at this point in time, we're not quite certain what our objectives are because we're still trying to figure out what is possible. But we have a suite there's some op different options as to what our objectives might be. We do know that, well, from the very beginning of COTS control, we've been seeking to protect assets. That's one objective that will remain constant. Um, but we can also have objectives around COTS and around corals themselves. We can decide that we want to actually reduce the damage caused by COTS, and that might be to focus in particular areas and just remove them from that site. But we might be more, want to be more strategic and think about reducing the downstream effects, um, influencing how the outbreak moves through the reef. And in that case, we might want to focus on locations where, which are sources for cots, so that we're trying to disrupt spread between different areas. We can do similar things for corals. We can focus on protecting particular sites because they're nice, because they're diverse, or because we're conducting restoration at those sites. But we might also want to pr protect the um, areas where we have lots of cots, uh, lots of coral larvae um, being produced. So um, those are the sorts of objectives that we might be choosing from. We haven't yet, we're more than likely going to be choosing a number of these different objectives. We have to recognise I'm being told to get to move along, so I'm going to have to move very quickly. Um, we're being told we have to recognise that COTS populations do different things at different spatial scales and our management needs to recognise that. So we need to have decisions at individual sites, at reefs, at local areas, as well as at the, at the GBR scale. Um, management also operates at different levels, at different scales in space and time. And so the decision support that we provide needs to actually inform how those decisions map on to what's happening within the COTS population dynamics. Overall, this is a simplified um, strategy, uh, I, illustration of how we've structured the research and uh, management strategy. Uh, essentially, maps onto what I've just talked about, we have in blue the areas where management will be making, uh, will be actually 
implementing action. So we have site control, which is added, you know, a polygon or a very an area of about a hectare or two. We have local areas with multiple hit polygons. We have regional areas, so within an outbreak area. Associated with each of those areas of action, we're going to have particular decisions that have to be made, and so research has to support those decisions. And research, those, that research will need to be informed by a whole lot of other research projects around sp that provide specific bits of information into those decision support tools. We need to think about where outbreaks are and how they're spreading, and so we have to have a surveillance strategy that informs um, that warns us about new outbreaks, but also tells us where we need to implement management, how the current outbreak is moving through an area. And finally, we need to have tools that help us make decisions about the large-scale objectives that we're trying to achieve with this program. I won't talk to all of these, but essentially in the session that's coming up, we have a range of different talks that touch on each of these different areas. Oops, and I just managed to turn that all off. Um, not all of this work is funded directly out of NEST, but what we're trying to do is take advantage of the NEST investment to um, coordinate and organise a whole lot of the research that's happening. Um, but we are already having quite significant effects on the way that the program is operating. So the current um, operations out on the water are employing some of the surveillance strategies that we've developed. The current voyage scheduling for the program is looking at some of the prioritisation that comes out of Carl Cox's work, um, identifying what are the most important reefs in terms of coral and cot sources and sinks. That determines where we go. Some of the analyses that you'll hear about this morning are informing the revisitation schedules, how quickly and how often we go back to particular sites. And we're working very closely with Kurumpa at the moment, trying to ensure that the thinking that's underpinned this work is feeding into the design and the operation for the expanded cost control program. So, just to wrap up, have we got it right with this strategy? Well, almost definitely not. Um, I'd like to claim that I'm perfect, but my mother will assure you that I am not. Um, so, if this has to be a learning process. We think we've got the right general framework, the details we're going to get wrong and we're probably going to have to shift things around a bit, but the idea is that we've got a good solid structure that will allow us to engage in that learning and the refining and uh, the experimentation. So hopefully what we've got is something that works to help inform management but also helps researchers identify where their research is going to fit in and how we can what its pathway to adoption is likely to look like in, within the control program itself. And my final point is that COTS management has been looked at as some, in the past as something that you do when you have a problem. And I think this is really a fundamental mistake. And it's part of the reason that there was so much confusion or there's still confusion about how COTS programs should operate. We really have to look at this as a long-term commitment. We need to invest, we need to have in the long term. Not just when we have an outbreak, but at other periods as well. And if things go the way they seem to be going, we're, we're probably almost going to have a permanent outbreak going into the future. So what we're hoping here is that we are providing an initial template for a long term slash permanent um, COTS program. Thanks. Thank you.